Tired of the everyday grind? Ever dream of a life of romantic adventure? Want to get away from it all? We offer you Escape. Escape, designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. You are standing in a darkened room in the heart of Russia's dread Lubyanka prison, your mind tortured in the blankness, while across a desk from you, happily smiling at you, is the chief of Russia's secret police, who intends to drive you to insanity or to death. Listen now as Escape brings you John Daner's exciting story, The Man with the Steel Teeth. began on the evening of April 29th. I was seated in my box at the Bolshoi Opera in Moscow, listening to a particularly fine performance of Boris Gudunov, when I felt a slap on my shoulder. Yes, police. What do you want? What? Now look here, what's this all about? You are under arrest. Arrest? What are you talking about? Come. There were two other men with him. Big men. In a moment, I found myself escorted down the corridor, down the grand staircase, and out into the dark street to a black limousine waiting in front. No one said a word as we sped through the streets, the men on either side of me staring straight ahead. Then we rounded a corner, and in a second, I knew our destination. The Bianca Prison. Home of a thousand ugly secrets. The dread MVD. We swung down a long ramp and came to a stop at a huge, unguarded bronze door. I was ushered into a small office bare except for a desk with some filing cabinets. A small, round man in a drab gray suit was standing near the desk watching us. From there, I was taken through another door and steered down a long corridor. It was the cell block. And I was a prisoner of the Soviet secret police. Artel Luttrell. Ah, Mr. Luttrell, how nice. Please, come in. Sit down. I'll be with you in a moment. My breakfast, you see. Mr. Lam. Tavarish Nachalnik. Give me a cup. Give me a cup. Give me a No, Tavarish Nachalnik. I was just after a cup. I was after a cup. Only that I finished. Yeah, right. How can you tell me such a beautiful and beautiful cup? Take a cup. Thank you. Thank you. Ah, B- Baltiski, da? Now, mm, just da. a minute. I've been here for two At days without a word as to why I've been arrested. I want an explanation. Look, I'm an accredited correspondent. My papers are in order. You know that. Now, what about it? I gave up. They had no intention of dealing with me until they were good and ready. I could see that. I watched the man behind the desk. He was the same one who'd been in the office when I was brought to Lubyanka. Inspector Golovin of the MPD. A small, round little man in a badly fitted gray suit. Gold-rimmed spectacles magnified his brown eyes, and when he smiled, his full lips uncovered the most fantastic set of stainless steel teeth I ever laid eyes on. Full uppers and lowers. 
Then the morning feast was ah. over. Ah, my dear Luttrell. <clears throat> How pleasant to see you again. Again? We've never met and you know it. Spasso House for one a year or so ago. A uh, reception for the Belarusian delegation to the All-Union Sports Congress last year. A uh, diplomatic banquet in honor of the President of the Uzbek People's Republic. Many places, my friend. I don't know you. I see we shall get on very well. Why am I here? A legitimate question. You are here to confess. Confess? To what? No, no, no. We have much time. No need to get excited so soon. I'm asking you again. Confess to what? Shall I read it to you? You've written my confession? Oh, no, no, my friend, no. Uh, these are the charges, only the charges. The confession is up to you. With my help, of course. You, you are interested? Go on. Uh, from the office of Max Golovin, Inspector District of Moscow, Lazar Tubian, First Officer. Uh, this does not concern you. Uh, tested to by the following officers of the People's State Security. That doesn't concern you. Uh, subject. Uh, concerning the activities of one Arthur Henderson Luttrell, uh, correspondent WNA, citizen United States of America, resident of Moscow two years, here and after called accused. One, that in the morning of August 21st, 1952, the accused was observed by witnesses in an exchange of objects with a Zaragin engineer, former member of Ukrainian People's uh, Agriculture Cooperative, while standing near north entrance to workers' power. The little man droned on, unreeling paragraph after paragraph of nonsense. Names of people I'd met as a reporter, or at official functions, or on the street, or anywhere. Names of people now dead or awaiting execution. It wasn't until this thought came that it dawned on me what my crime might be. And in the last paragraph, Golovin confirmed it. And that Arthur Henderson Luttrell is accused of the crime of espionage and the encouragement of sabotage. That by the use of personal influence, he contributed to the deviation of 12 individuals since convicted, sentenced, <clears throat> and in four separate instances um, executed for crimes of treason against the state. Well? Very clever. Nothing clever, my dear friend. Merely a recitation of facts. From all the people I know here, you take the few names that'll make a case for you. What's more, some of them are dead. But why? What am I supposed to have done? Do you or do you not confess? To a trumped-up deal like this? No, not on your life. Eh, uh, on your life, Mr. Luttrell. Sergeant, obedivo. You have been asked the question, my dear boy. Do you or do you not confess? Go to the devil. He shot us. Confess. No. Confess. Confess. Then they tried psychological persuasion. The method, to wear me down to the point of exhaustion when I would gladly sign anything in exchange for a night's sleep. You will confess. You will read from this paper, then you will sleep. No. You will read the following. The charges brought against me are true. I am guilty of sabotage. Read it, Mr. Luttrell. I am guilty. Read it. I am Guilty of sabotage and the use of personal influence to encourage political deviation and sabotage in others. Go on. Yeah. Then you will sleep. Go on. In the instances of Nikita Kaz, Alexis Zahajin, uh -huh. Anton Schwernik, in Mikhail Bagratin. I was unquestionably a primary factor in... No. No, it's not true. It's not true. I will not... I...
and I awoke to find myself back in my cell. Then I noticed something was strange, something different about my cell, an unnatural stillness. It took an effort to focus at the moment. Then I saw what it was. My cell door was open, just a crack, but it was open. It had always been closed and double locked each time I was returned from questioning. But now it was open. Reason told me it was another way of torturing me, a trap. But I had to try. Cautiously, I stepped out into the broad corridor. And I moved past the line of cells. If I could reach the bronze doors, the bronze doors outside, escape. And then, I was standing before the door to the office. It was too easy. They'd be waiting on the other side. They'd be there. Empty. No Golovin. Nobody. In the corner behind the desk stood a coat rack. On it hung an overcoat and a black hat. I took them, put them on, walked to the bronze doors. And I was outside. Except for a black limousine that stood across the parking area, the place was deserted. Nobody. My first thought was the embassy. If I can get to the embassy, I'm safe. I looked again at the limousine. An official car of the MVD. Trying to be as casual as possible, I went over and looked in. The ignition keys were there. I got in quickly, stepped on the starter. I drove carefully, alive to the fact that the city had a thousand eyes. It was early morning. A few cars were on the street. The commissars and sub-commissars, associate commissars and their assistants. Soviet official them rolling to work on privileged wheels. And suddenly the welcome sight of the embassy came into view. It loomed large and took shape as I approached. There was a car parked in front of the main embassy entrance. I pulled up behind it. I was about to set the handbrake when I saw something that turned my blood to water. Not 40 feet from me, leaning against the stone post of the entrance gate, was a man in an overcoat. He was absorbed with a small hand mirror in which he was examining his teeth probing here and there with his forefinger. It was Inspector Golovin. We will return to escape in just a moment, but first, answering the call of the sick and the distressed at home and at the battlefield is the job of the Red Cross. This month, the Red Cross is asking for contributions to carry on this wonderful work for another year. Can we do less than answer the call ourselves? Give as much as you can to the American Red Cross. And now, back to Escape. I slid down in my seat. Golovin didn't look up, but I knew he'd seen me and was just waiting. And I saw the bulge in his coat pocket. I had no chance against a pistol. I started the car and pulled out into the street. In the rearview mirror, I saw Golovin go to his car and start after me. I was in a panic. At the corner, I turned left and headed toward Red Square. I hoped that once there, I could cut across the square into one of the side streets and double back to the embassy. But about halfway across the square, I saw a car move out of the thin line of traffic in back of me. It was Golovin, and I had to abandon my plan for the moment. Then began a dodging game that took us through the west section of Moscow and into the industrial suburbs. Time after time, I was sure I'd lost it. But he would seemingly materialize out of nowhere and fasten himself onto me. It went on and on until we neared the railroad yards. We were racing down a cobblestone street laced with track. 
Golovin was closing on me fast. He called my name as his car came alongside, then began forcing me off the road. There was only one way out. I whipped my wheel to the right and skidded onto a bridge. I picked up speed and in a while found myself in open country with Golovin nowhere in sight. I had lost Golovin, for he had lost me. What difference? I had no chance of ever getting back to the embassy now. The MVD would be there waiting for me with a color guard. So I drove on. On the strength of an MVD identity card I found in the pocket of my overcoat, I obtained gasoline at a small town. And then a few miles from Smolensk, I had a nasty shock. It was a roadblock. Two trucks were placed squarely across the road 20 feet apart. Soldiers with Tommy guns stood in the light of flares, motioning me to stop. There was nothing to do but pull over. A soldier came over and flashed a light in the window. Tovarish, dobry wiecie. Dobry wiecie. Izvinite, tovarish, pokażicie wasze bumagi. O, MVD, idite. Izwaniaju, tovarish, sergeant. Što to slučila z dym... Demidov, could you help Pavelic? Spokojnej nochi. Spokojnej nochi. The soldier waved me on. The MVD identity card had done it. I drove steadily the rest of that night and all the next day. Late the following night, I reached the outskirts of Warsaw. The time had come to abandon the MVD car. It had served its purpose, but by now the entire secret police undoubtedly was alerted to watch for me. So I left it at the side of the road and started walking. In half an hour, I was at my destination, the apartment of an old friend. I was on the ragged edge, needed rest. What is it? Hello, Maria. Chicago! May I come in? Oh, Chicago, you are a ghost. Yes, come in. I'm very tired. Sit down here, my darling. Uh, oh, how good that feels. I will make some tea for you. Such a surprise to see you, my Chicago. What has happened to you? Are you not in Moscow? <laughs> no, of course you are not in Moscow. You are here. Why are you here, Chicago? Chicago? Chicago. Already you are sleeping. That is good. You sleep, my darling. Morning. Ah, Chicago. Finally you waked up. But it is not morning. It is two o'clock in the afternoon. How do you feel now? You sleep good. Oh, it's heaven. You going to stay awake now? I give you a cup of coffee. You're an angel. Never mind the angel talking. Here. Thanks. First cup of coffee I've had in two months. Now, you must tell me, Chicago, what has happened? Where do you come from? Where do you go? <laughs> Old cotton-eyed Joe. Old witch? Your question. Uh, where do you come from? Where do you go? Like old Cotton Eye Joe, an American folk song. Oh. <laughs> Never mind. Sit down. I'll tell you. Oh, I have missed you, Chicago. And when you came in last night, I was very happy. You're still as beautiful as ever, Maria. But I am wrong to talk this way to you. Everything was finished two years ago, and so it must remain. I still think we were fools. Shh, now forget. Forget. Now, you in a lot of trouble, eh? Yeah, a lot. You talk in your sleep. What did I say? I could not understand everything, but you keep on killing a man. Golovin. Golovin, that is the name. You must hate him to kill him so much. Well, he gave me a lot of trouble. 
Oh? What'd he look like? Oh, a small man, quite small. Maybe a little fat? Yeah. Does he wear glasses? <laughs> I really talked in my sleep, didn't I? No, but there is such a man outside in the street who looks like that. What? Wait. He's still there. Come, look, but be careful. Don't let him see you. Across the street, see? He has been there all day. He was there this morning. He's an inspector for the MVD. MVD? You are in a lot of trouble. All I want is to get to Berlin. Yes, you must leave Warsaw. Can you help me? I think so. I know someone. Can he be trusted? You know my brother, Bronislaw? B He's with the communists. I shall let you decide that when you meet him. <laughs> Only as a last resort. So, go over your cards again, and we shall see if you know them. Uh, the personal identification card. Talk. The uh, gasoline ration card. Talk. Uh, ID badge where I work. Inspector for the state, state fisheries. Talk. talk. Uh, travel permit uh -huh. and work record. Good. Now we go. Maria, I, I don't know how. Shh, shh. Not one word from you. You saved my life, Maria. I'll never forget. So, give me a kiss now. Uh, come, come now, let us go. Goodbye, my beautiful Chicago. Goodbye. <laughs> Bronislav led me down the stairs and out the back door to the alley where his car was parked. There was no sign of Golovin. A relief, to be sure, but still a surprise, since both of us half expected to see him. Maria's brother had done a first-class job arranging my escape. From Warsaw to Berlin was a cruise. Clear sailing all the way. It was a lovely summer night when we arrived in Berlin. We drove as near to the line dividing the sectors as we could. I got out. There was a handshake between us, and Bronislav was gone. I started walking to the end of the street, the end of Soviet influence. Ten yards away, I rounded a corner and... Good evening, Luttrell. Golovin. The little man blocked my path so I couldn't get by. His hands were thrust deep in his pockets, a frightening smile on his face. So now it is the end of the road for us, no, Luttrell? For a while, I thought this moment would never come to pass. But now it is all over. As he spoke, he withdrew a small pistol from his pocket. He balanced it casually in his hand and continued talking. It was the end for me. To think, Luttrell, that the whole adventure turned out exactly as I had planned. From the moment you left your cell till now, every move you made as I had planned. <laughs> I showed you well the way, no? So you're pleased with yourself, Golovin. Fine, but let's get this over with. What? <laughs> you do not understand, Littrell. I allowed you to escape. So you could shoot me at the end of the road. Quite the saddest, aren't you? I allowed it so that I could make my own way here. Look, don't play games, Golovin. Games? No games. This entire thing was planned for my escape. Your escape? Mine. By following you, I could give the impression that I was only doing my duty by pursuing an escaped prisoner. <laughs> A prisoner who... By chance, you understand, led me to here. You still do not believe me, do you? I... I just don't follow, that's all. Luttrell, in my country, it is bad to life. Now it is even worse. Soon my colleagues would have seen the things I could no longer hide, and then would come the purge. My purge. I had to leave before that could happen. So, now... I find it kind of hard to swallow, I'll tell you that. Uh, here, uh, take my gun. Take it. Now you believe? <laughs> Come, my dear boy, we cannot stand here. Let us go across the road. Uh, you see, 
I need you to vouch for my story when I am questioned. Uh, one thing, Golovin. Uh-huh. What would you have done if you'd found that your colleagues were closing in on you? I would have seized you immediately, taken you back to Lubyanka. You were uh, never exactly what you would call safe, Mr. Luttrell. Uh, you were my insurance. Yeah. This is the American sector? Mm-hmm. My territory now. Oh, then we must seek the military police, and I give myself up. Yeah. Yeah, I guess they would like to have a talk with you. So now, my dear boy... Now, wait a minute, Golovin. Wait? <laughs> Why did you do that? A lot of reasons. You figure them out. My knuckles hurt. They were bleeding. Golovin sat on the pavement looking stupid. I turned to go, and as I did, he took his hand from his mouth. His full lips hung slack, revealing his steel teeth bent grotesquely out of shape. I shuddered and went to find the military police. Under the direction of Anthony Ellis, Escape has brought you The Man with the Steel Teeth by John Daner, starring Harry Bartell. Featured in the cast were Jack Crucian, Charlotte Lawrence, Steve Roberts, and Paul Dubov. Editorial supervision is by John Meston. And the special music for Escape is composed and conducted by Leith Stevens. Next week... You are 400 feet below the surface of the South Pacific, the heavy taste of chlorine gas souring your mouth, while somewhere up above you, searching through the night for you, is an enemy destroyer bent on sending the submarine and you to a murky death. So listen next week when Escape brings you Richard Chand Lee's exciting story... Pressure. Tomorrow night on most of these same CBS radio stations, Lux Radio Theater presents Dennis Morgan and Virginia Mayo in the thrilling drama, This Woman is Dangerous. Also tomorrow evening, hear John Hodiak in Suspense's chilling production of The Mountain, a story well calculated to keep you in suspense. This is Roy Rowan speaking. And remember, you have a date with Arthur Godfrey's Talent Scouts every Monday evening on the CBS Radio Network. <laughs>